um, Theodore Weld and so on. They, that was not their experience. They could only speak to it from, um, you know, an intellectual perspective. So now you have guys like Bib coming on the scene who had escaped, who who lived through it, who were whipped, whose backs were scarred, whose um, families, like his natal family, like his, his mom, uh, Mildred lost her children. She lost her sons. They were all sold away into slavery. And and then he grew up and he got married. And this this is Henry. And, and losing his family too. Losing his wife, losing his child. So he, he, he came with pathos. And he came with experience. And he came with, with this sorrow. Which, which was what moved people. He wasn't inventing anything. Um, these were his real life um, experiences. Mm -hmm. That, of course, and you know, when you um, read his narrative in some of the, the concluding chapter, he talks about being so low in spirit when Melinda left or when they were sold away from each other and. And I think it, what, he's suffering from depression. Yeah. You know, today that's what we would say. He talks about, he, he displayed the symptoms of people who say who are suffering from depression. Of course. Yes. Because you had your heart ripped out of you, right? And, and I remember him talking about in the narrative about um, how he had grown up with only the taste of of freedom on his mind and mm -hmm. then when he met Melinda all of a sudden he felt just as strongly as he did about freedom about somebody another human being mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how this was the first time he thought about something more precious than his mm -hmm. own freedom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so then that 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 um, poignancy of him losing that yeah uh, that yeah. relationship yes. is, is it's yeah. just no it was hard and lo losing his daughter yeah. and then seeing his daughter being slapped by by the, like the slave Whit mistress. Whitfield. yeah yeah you and know the, the, the little girl and also fearful about her future because he thought that she would be sold into the fancy girls trade because she was um, she was so light um, and, and so intelligent. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. um, this kind of, I'm going to uh, ask a different question that I, I had listed here, but um, Henry learned to read and write once he had finally reached the North and was compelled to share his powerful story and publish his account. I love how you wrote in Henry's voice and his, you know, we're talking about his his uh, psychology here, mm -hmm. um, his consciousness in your book for youth, mm -hmm. the, My Name is Henry Bibb, A Story of Slavery and Freedom. It rings so true and with such strength and clarity. Uh, what are some of the distinctive traits that you found embedded in his writing, in his, in his actions, in his activism that, um, that have, in in his voice that has yeah. been hidden for so long. What did you find in well, his personality? Well, I I was trying to imagine myself in his shoes, in kind of his headspace, and clearly Henry Bibb was very intelligent. He came up to Detroit um, practically illiterate. Um, he did talk about. Um, uh, on on the plan, one of the plantations or one of the farms in Kentucky, this um, young white girl teaching mm -hmm. some of the slave children to read, but of course her school was broken up by the slaveholders. They thought this was dangerous business, so that was shut down. But when he got up to Detroit and um, Reverend um, William Monroe, who was also one of the the stellar abolitionists in the state of Michigan, in the whole there was a whole circle of black abolitionists there, William Monroe, George de Baptiste, um, Lightfoot, all of those men who were also freedom 
freedom workers, I call them. They were all underground railroad people and they had that secret network. Well, William Monroe of, of the Baptist Church there in Detroit was Bibb's teacher. He taught, he taught him to read and write. I wondered about where yeah, he learned. Yeah, he went to school in Detroit and, and learned really, really fast. And, um, he was ripe. He, yeah, he, was, he wanted it, he was ready for it. So literacy, of course, was, was this great goal for, for black people, mm -hmm. um, free black people and enslaved black people. And people who were free sought it. And they established schools and they established academies. Or if they could afford a tutor, they, they would do so. So that was, that was a great goal. They, they thirsted for it. And because, you know, why be literate? Why have literacy? Henry Bibb in The Voice of the Fugitive, he said literacy and education was, was the key. It was like the key to, to open the world, mm -hmm. really. Um, so I, I thought going back, thinking, you know, putting my head in, in his head as a child in the book, um, my name is Henry Bibb, Story of Slavery and Freedom, uh, seeing his, his slave mistress, because the little girl Harriet was actually his owner, seeing Harriet being tutored uh, by private tutors and knowing that that was not for him. He couldn't have that. Or with Harriet being sent away to a girl's academy and the wages that Henry earned as a slave would pay for Harriet's school fees and he couldn't have that, and that was his money and his labor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it made him want literacy even more. It made yeah. him quested for that education. And for the justice, too. And for the justice, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And so he and his wife, Mary, mm -hmm. that's one of the things they did when they came over to Ontario, was just to open schools. Mm -hmm for children of the fugitives and for any child actually who wanted to learn. Um, I know you're preparing to publish more about Henry and his, or maybe you already, you said you already had, uh, published more about Henry and his second wife um, and the influence that their publications and writings had on both sides of the border. Mm -hmm. uh, during Henry's last years, 1850 to 1854, they lived in, in Sandwich, Ontario, as you said, which is just in Windsor now, isn't it's it? It's in Windsor. It's a part of Windsor right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, what were some of Henry's contributions to Canadian society that we have ignored for too long and that you would like to see given more attention to as we both educate ourselves and the next generation about Afro-Ontarian? History. Well, for one, I mean, his contribution to print culture. Um, he started the Voice of the Fugitive, as we said, his first black newspaper in Canada. So you have this this editor um, establishing the, this newspaper to to talk about black life or to showcase black life, and that's one of the things he did at a time when blacks were spoken of in a very disparaging way mm -hmm. in mainstream white media in, in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when the launch voice of the fugitive, he said, we, we, we need an organ on, on which to hang our banners high, on which to talk. Because he said, the, the media, I'm paraphrasing him, is the creator of opinions. And he said, authors through the media, through the newspapers, have been creating um, negative images about us as mm -hmm. black people. So we need to have our own media, our own newspapers, so we can tell our own stories. And that's what they did in The Voice of the Fugitive. They talk, you know, they talked about baptism and births and weddings and school graduations and schools being established and farming opportunities and you can go there and buy land for it was information, it was information valuable. for valuable for the black community and, and um, routes to traveling to Canada. Because people would write Henry Bibb and say, we, we, we're going to escape, we're going to escape on Elgar River, what's the best route? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there, there in the newspaper he would say, well, maybe come this way, come through Rochester, do this, or it was incredible. And um, he himself would go over to Detroit sometimes, take the ferry, 
cross the river go and bring fugitives over into Ontario. Um, or, or also go further south and bring people up. So he, he did underground railroad work while he was in Canada. But he certainly used this newspaper. I remember reading an article about um, uh, African Americans going over to Liberia yeah. and opening up a college in, in Monrovia, Liberia. Stuff like that. Or a black um, young person who was trained at a doctor in a college somewhere. You know, um, so it, it, it was about race uplift, but it was an abolitionist newspaper. So the principal question that was asked daily or engaged in on a daily basis in that newspaper was the question of slavery and freedom. You know, the, it says we are devoted to the immediate end of slavery, wherefore education, temperance, and you know, other aspects of race uplift. That was the question. That was what everybody was about. Slavery must end. And for those of us who live in freedom, then we have to uplift the race into racial discrimination because they were very much aware that, yes, we are living in freedom. Slavery has ended. But here in Ontario, we are facing a lot of racial discrimination. Segregation. There is a segregation, mm -hmm. the school segregation, the segregation in, in public spaces and public facilities. Um, there was a lot of racism. The white newspaper came out against the black community. It was not easy. So they were fighting this double fight every day. And what a and what a blow when this is your mecca and you come, you yeah. know, you come to the promised land and uh, it's not. It's not what you had hoped. It's not. It's not. <laughs> you have to fight some more. It's not the utopia. And, yeah, the biggest struggle I think was the school segregation. Yeah and um, black children uh, in